straight ahead on Law & Crime Daily. The widow of Kobe Bryant, Vanessa, naming the deputies accused of sharing photos of the deadly helicopter crash, the pending lawsuit, and legal action. And free Britney protesters are back in the streets as the pop icon wants another conservator appointed to serve alongside her father. Britney Spears deserves to be free after 13 years. Plus, more jurors are seated on the Derek Chauvin trial as we await a judge's ruling on major decisions. The city of Minneapolis defending its $27 million settlement with the family of George Floyd. I'll note that it was a unanimous decision. Law & Crime Daily covering court cases from coast to coast. Welcome everyone to Law & Crime Daily. I'm Brian Buckmeyer along with Terry Austin. Two more jurors have been selected to serve on the Derek Chauvin murder trial. Law & Crime's Kim Johnson is at the Hennepin County Courthouse and is here to break down day nine. Hi, Brian. Jury selection does continue here in downtown Minneapolis. Attorneys are trying to agree on 14 impartial jurors. That's 12 jurors plus two alternates in Derek Chauvin's murder trial. As you said, two additional jurors have been seated. One is a white woman in her 50s who works as a cardiac care nurse. She was grilled about whether she can avoid being an expert witness in deliberations and put aside previous professional knowledge about resuscitation and police's split second decision. We have a clip of that line of questioning. Take a listen. I recognize the amount of time that a person can be without air before they're unconscious. Mm -hmm. So how do you set aside your personal training, your personal knowledge, and judge the case on the facts as presented in court in that instance? I'd have to weigh what the expert would say okay. and then how the judge directs to follow. Okay. Now, prosecutors wanted to know if she sees patients with opioid addiction. She said it is a growing problem and acknowledged that addiction can affect anyone. Another juror seated is a black grandmother who volunteers at a youth organization. She supports Black Lives Matter, has a relative who works for the Minneapolis Police Department and supports them as well. With the addition of two jurors Wednesday, the jury of 11 so far is nearly half men, half women, half identify as white and half as people of color. Now, Friday is expected to be a big day in court. Judge Peter Cahill said that he plans to rule on emotions of whether to delay or move this trial due to the high publicity of a settlement between the city and George Floyd's family. Brian. Thanks, Kim. Outside of the courthouse, the Minneapolis mayor answered questions from reporters about why the city announced the $27 million settlement before the criminal case concluded. We got you know, very clear recommendations from our attorneys given their legal expertise. Uh, and you know, I'll note that it was a unanimous decision uh, coming from a very a council with many diverse uh, uh, standpoints and backgrounds. There's no guarantee, for instance, that that deal would be available two, four, six, eight weeks from now or six months from now. And we decided to move forward with the Floyd family. We are following the judge's instructions and certainly are not willing to speak about events happening in that criminal trial in that courtroom. It would be inappropriate. I don't think the judge would like us to say one way or the other about the issues you raised that are happening in the trial right now. And that lawsuit was organized on behalf of the George Floyd family with the assistance of attorney Benjamin Crump. Joining us now is criminal defense attorney Sue Ann Robinson, an attorney for the Ben Crump Law Firm. Sue Ann, Benjamin Crump said this was a historic settlement. What does it mean to have the city settle at this amount and in the middle of jury selection for Chauvin's trial? I think it tells the public that when a black person dies at the hands of police brutality, that it's worthy of consequences and that their life is not trivial and it in fact matters. And it happening right during the jury selection gives the jury pool that exact story, the narrative that his life mattered, that it's not trivial, and that it's worthy of consequences. All right. I think that's a lot of people are seeing here, both in the dollar amounts, I think Benjamin Crump said, is the highest amount uh, in terms of a wrongful death pre-trial. And then, of course, the questions that follow. Uh, let's bring in co-host Terry Austin. Terry, since the settlement, potential jurors were questioned if this settlement changed their opinion, but do you think it even should? 
Well, Brian, it should not influence their opinion, but it could influence their opinion. And we've seen that it has. Judge Cahill made sure he questioned those jurors who were on the jury at that point in time. And he ended up actually asking two of them to leave because they basically said that they had made certain assumptions. So I don't think that it should influence, but clearly it has. Technically, the two suits have nothing to do with the other. One is civil, one is criminal. One has additional parties. The criminal suit does not. And we know that they're different standards. Obviously, in the criminal case, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a preponderance of the evidence in the civil case. So they have nothing to do with each other, but clearly jurors are influenced when they hear about the civil suit. Yeah, and we saw two potential jurors excused because of that. Sue Ann, it looks like there will be three experts in the case, the defenses, the prosecution, and the 10th juror are cardiac care nurse. Is that risky or wise uh, on the part of the lawyers to have her on the jury? I think that it's risky in the sense that I under my understanding is that the defense plan on giving a lot of medical testimony so it could be risky if she's in there and she in the jury room and she's asked questions and she has the experience but every juror brings their experience to the table it's whether or not they can be fair fair and impartial and look at the facts and be fair and impartial so I don't I think it could harm the defense if they present medical information that's different from her understanding and her training and she gives that information to her fellow jurors. But I also think that just because of her life experience and her work doesn't make say that she can't be fair and impartial. It's gonna be interesting to see how this all plays out. Thank you both. Be sure to tune in to the Law & Crime Network for gavel to gavel coverage of the Derek Chauvin trial in the murder of George Floyd. Still ahead on Law & Crime Daily, a judge denies a motion to seal the names of deputies who shared Kobe Bryant's helicopter crash site photos. And Vanessa Bryant is naming names. But first, the conservatorship battle in the middle of the hashtag Free Britney movement continues. See who is arguing there should be another co-conservator. Welcome back. There's a new wrinkle in the Britney Spears conservatorship battle as she tries to bring someone else on board. Law and Crimes' Ann Jeanette Levy is here with the new details. Brian, someone, uh, Britney Spears had already won one court battle with this when she got the court to appoint Bessemer Trust as a co-conservator to help oversee her finances. Now she is asking that someone else be brought in as a co-conservator to help her with her personal affairs. Supporters of Britney Spears bid to end her conservatorship flocked again to the courthouse as Spears asked that Jody Montgomery be appointed as conservator of her personal affairs. Britney Spears being free does not just mean her dad being removed as conservator. Britney Spears being free means her being out of the conservatorship entirely. Montgomery acted as Spears' conservator when Spears' father, Jamie, dealt with some health problems in 2019. Britney's attorney has said she fears her father and wants him removed. Jamie Spears has been conservator of Britney's estate since 2008. His attorney told Good Morning America that Jamie loves his daughter and has protected her from people looking to take advantage of her. He has collaborated with her. Uh, he, when she is up for performing, she has performed. When she wants to record an album, she can record an album. And when she wants to live her life the way she wants, like a normal person, he has collaborated with her to do that as well. Attorney Vivian Thorine disputes Brittany has ever mentioned fearing her dad. Anytime there's that amount of money to be made, you have to question the motives of everyone close to that person. Britney Spears' conservatorship has received a lot of attention after a New York Times documentary, Framing Britney Spears, was released. It suggested Britney's father was controlling her because of the massive amount of money to be made off of her image. Fans of Britney Spears are fueling the Free Britney movement, a movement that appears to be gaining steam. A lot more people have been becoming aware because of things in the media and this movement, and Britney means a lot to me. Now, it appears that Britney Spears wants Jody Montgomery to share these duties with her father over her personal affairs, which would further limit Jamie Spears' stay in her life. The judge will rule on this latest request next month. Brian? 
Thanks. Back to discuss the latest in the conservatorship of Britney Spears is criminal defense attorney Sue Ann Robinson and Terry Austin. Sue Ann, Britney Spears won the financial battle, it seems. Is this now a push to get more autonomy in her personal life? Definitely. Britney is suffering from a conservatorship that was first placed upon her 12 years ago. Is it right that something that a breakdown that happened 12 years ago today they're still questioning her ability to take care of herself, to make her own personal decisions, to have that autonomy. I don't think it's fair. I think she should have her autonomy and her personal affairs. She's 38 years old, and she's clearly been able to maintain her career throughout this entire thing. So she should be given back her personal affairs at minimum. Now, Terry, could this be a power play to slowly push Jamie Spears out of controlling Britney Spears' life? Absolutely, Brian. I think we are all in adamant agreement, and certainly Britney's fans are in adamant agreement, that her father is slowly being moved out, but he should just be moved out. Remember, when she asked the court to move him out of the conservatorship, what they did is, like Antoinette said, they put Bessemer Trust as the co-conservator, so Bessemer Trust handled the financial affairs, but the father was still handling the personal affairs. Now what she's doing is saying, Look, this Montgomery individual, I like what she's doing. Let her share as a permanent conservator with the father on the personal affairs. But I think everyone is hoping that ultimately the court is going to say, Brittany, you've been handling your own affairs. You're doing it well, and you can do it on your own. So hopefully that will ultimately be the decision of the court. Hopefully. And Jeanette, the Free Brittany movement is kind of fascinating, but her fans say this isn't just about Brittany. So what is it about? Yeah, it's pretty interesting when you actually talk to some of them. A lot of them have done a lot of reading on the conservatorship statutes, the, the rules of them, the, the issues surrounding them. And a lot of them say they think that the system needs to be reformed because basically when people are under a conservatorship, it is incredibly difficult in California to get out of one. So it's almost like a permanent thing. Typically when people are in a conservatorship, it's because they're really ill and they can't make decisions for themselves. So a lot of her fans think it's not just about Britney, it's about the conservatorship, the whole legal issue itself. Definitely, cases like this draw attention to large issues in the criminal justice system, or even conservatorships, and maybe this will cause some change in that structure, not just in Britney's life. Coming up on Law & Crime Daily, there are many ways to become a prom queen and get great grades, but there is one way to do that and end up arrested. You don't want to miss this. Plus, why it's never a good idea to talk back to a judge. The tough work us public defenders have to do next. Welcome back. March 18, 1962, public defenders were created. Usually, we protect clients from the state sometimes from themselves. As Law & Crime founder and host of the a &E series, Court Cam tells us one defendant just didn't know when enough was enough. He's high risk, so I'm gonna raise the bond to 5,000. We're at bond court in Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah, I'm a, I think 1,000 is reasonable given that these are felony charges. Good luck, sir. Judge Smith has a full plate of bond hearings. Okay. We have... I actually have a car that I'm trying to sell on Craigslist. Stop, stop, stop talking. I'm gonna give you a public defender. Michael All Ray, right. cases 87 and 88. Next up is Michael Ray, who's facing four charges, including criminal trespassing and second-degree assault. A bond or a bail hearing is usually a quick proceeding if the defendant is cooperative. The prosecutor suggests a bail amount for Ray based on the crime in the defendant's history. The county's requesting $25,000 full cash fine. All charges... <laughs> You think that's yeah. funny? I think that's hilarious. We weren't done. Ray might feel $25,000 is too high, but sarcasm won't get him a reduction, and the judge lets him know it. All right, so bond is $50,000. No bail credit. I Danger to community. Thinks these are funny charges. He's lucky I didn't hold him in contempt. Ray just had his bond doubled. But as he re-enters the hallway, he has something else to say. Hope I see him straight. Uh, I'll get, bring him in. I'm uh -oh, putting hold him in here. contempt. Adding charges. Okay. Ray's language isn't the only thing to upset the judge. According to court officials, 
the defendant also gave her the middle finger. 30 days to serve on contempt for flipping me off twice. The judge calls him back, but it looks like he's gone. If we bring him back in, he's just going to get another 30 days for doing something else. So they move on to the next case. Case number 90, Scott Raymer. When, sure enough, Ray comes back for more. Oh, here he oh, comes. He's back. Sir, I'm holding you in contempt for what you did. What's your holding me in? And so. You, man, you All right, you can take him back. 100 days to serve. 100 days to serve? Okay. Yeah. For what? Because of two EPOs and a criminal mission case? That's right. The judge just gave him 100 days in jail. He's done. Ray could just walk away without making matters even worse, but he goes a different route. I think we need to. Yeah. Stop. Can we bring him back? He's got to be charged. Yes. What started out as four serious charges has grown into a grand total of 10, all in the span of approximately three minutes. I peeked my head around. I said, Ben, don't. Yeah. No, I figure that's just a lesson on what not to do. So you all are good. Corkan airs Wednesday at 9 p.m. on the AE Networks. When we come back, Vanessa Bryant publicly names the officers accused of sharing horrific photos of a crash that claimed nine lives. The names and the lawsuit next. Welcome back. Let's check in on some top legal news making headlines at the Long Crime Network. Actor Johnny Depp is accusing his ex-wife, Amber Heard, of lying about donating her $7 million divorce settlement to charity. Depp is asking a UK court of appeal for a retrial of his libel claim against the British tabloid, The Sun. The Sun published a report in April 2019 calling Depp a, quote, wife beater. Heard testified during the libel trial as a star witness for The Sun, detailing several instances in which she says Depp assaulted her. Attorneys for Depp say the truth of her claim about donating the money to charity would have impacted her credibility as a witness. A mother and daughter are accused of rigging the vote to make sure she would be homecoming queen. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement says an assistant principal, Laura Rose Carroll, gave her 17-year-old daughter access to her school district account. Investigators determined the daughter then cast more than 117 votes for herself in her high school's homecoming court. The FDLE also says the daughter used the account to look at her classmates' grades. They are both arrested and are facing several criminal charges. More than a year after the death of NBA legend Kobe Bryant, his widow Vanessa is taking to social media to post the names of the sheriff's deputies accused of sharing photos of the helicopter crash. Kobe Bryant, his daughter Gianna, and seven others died last January after the helicopter they were riding in crashed in California. After the crash, several Los Angeles County Sheriff's deputies are accused of sharing unauthorized and graphic photos of the deadly scene. Vanessa Bryant is suing the Sheriff's Department, seeking damages for negligence and invasion of privacy. A federal judge rejected the Sheriff's Office request to keep the names of the accused deputies under seal. Now, Vanessa Bryan has shared portions of her lawsuit on Instagram circling the names of the four deputies. The lawsuit accuses Deputy Joey Cruz of sharing photos of Kobe Bryant's body with a bartender and three others of passing around gratuitous photos of the dead children, parents, and coaches. According to the lawsuit, none of the deputies were directly involved in the crash nor had a legitimate purpose in sharing the photos. The Los Angeles County Sheriff says that someone at the bar overheard the conversation and reported it to law enforcement. The lawsuit goes on to say that within 48 hours of the crash, at least 10 members of the sheriff's department obtained photos of the victim's remains on their personal cell phones. The sheriff says the photos have since been deleted. The NTSB concluded last month that decisions made by the pilot during the flight led to the helicopter crash. He didn't follow any of the recommended uh, uh, mitigations for uh, entering uh, instrument meteorological conditions or to properly, once he had entered them, configure the aircraft by slowing down, by starting a climb, by activating the autopilot. None of that happened. The sheriff posting on Twitter Wednesday night, we will refrain from trying this case in the media and will wait for the appropriate venue. Our hearts go out to all the families affected by this tragedy. 
Here with us one last time is Sue Ann Robinson and Terry Austin. Sue Ann, it's a little ironic that the deputies accused of sharing photos are asking for privacy and not having their names released, but the judge decided against that. Do you agree with that decision? Absolutely. This is a hard, tragic lesson in what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And if they thought it was appropriate to overstep their professional bounds and share these photos with people in the public, then they can be the stars. They can get photo credit for doing such a horrible thing. And I'm pretty sure liability is there, especially since they weren't even involved in the case. They were literally there acting as paparazzi with badges. It's very sad. Paparazzi with badges is a great way to describe it. Terry, you know me, I'm pro-defense. I'm always looking for an argument, but is there a defense by the sheriffs that I'm missing? Because it seems like uh, they should probably settle. You know, I agree with you and I agree with Sue Ann. There is no question that there is liability here. The own report from the sheriff's office says that they failed to even try to track down copies of the photos, try to sequester the copies of those photos. And so her claim for negligence and invasion of privacy, I think, is a really strong claim. And what you know, good for the goose is good for the gander. She's named these individuals in her lawsuit. She has every right to do so. The judge previously ruled that she has every right to do so. So I think the case should proceed, you know, proceed forward. Or to your point, Brian, maybe the sheriff's office and the authorities should consider settling because I don't think they have a valid defense. Yeah, my thing is not only do I not see much of a defense, but real quick, Terry, can you imagine a trial in the L.A. Re region where Kobe Bryant is the person who's dead? What juror is going to vote against that family? Well, that's right. We're in California, and we know that that is a huge area for a Kobe fan, so they should settle. Yeah, California, L.A., America, the world, all Kobe friends. Thank you for joining us, ladies, and thank you for joining us here on Law & Crime Daily. We'll see you next time as we discuss justice in America.